got interested in uh, the nuclear issue. Of course, at the time of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki when I was 16, but I didn't really get involved in uh, what we were doing in nuclear power and nuclear weapons production until about 35 years ago. And at that time it was because uh, my son, Jack, was a freshman in college in environmental engineering at Tufts University and he came home at Christmas and said, you might be interested in a paper I wrote. I said, oh yes, I'm sure I would, but it was about thermal pollution from nuclear reactors, not even radioactive. So I read it dutifully, and then with mounting fascination and horror, I thought, this can't be true, because the cooling of the reactors across the country was warming the water in streams, rivers, and shorelines in the ocean, and it was affecting aquatic life uh, negatively. And I thought, well, this can't be true, because if it were, scientists, botanists, marine biologists, and fishing communities would be up in arms. But I found it wasn't secret, it's just that nobody was really registering that. So I became involved and took part in a, a citizen's lawsuit against the Virginia Electric Power Company when we were living in Washington. We Wait. lost, but it changed my life. And that was just based on the thermal... Uh... No, so that was my... I got interested. So then I began to learn more, and of course the radioactive pollution was uh, even more, far more horrifying. And um, I got kind of depressed about it, as a matter of fact and thought, what's the point of trying to do anything? And then I thought, well, the best recipe, if you're feeling overwhelmed by the information, as I was, was, just like you're doing, to take action. And I joined a team at, at Critical Mass, Ralph Nader's Critical Mass, that was doing a people's a legal intervention at the North Anna Reactor to windward of Washington. Uh, Virginia Electric Power Company wanted to rack the uh, spent or radiated fuel rods tighter than the regulations were permitting. Now that's common practice because the pools get our insufficient room and we still don't know what to do with the nuclear waste. So that's what uh, a big step in my life. And then that helped me to understand that uh, the issue of nuclear waste is so much bigger than the term suggests. It's that at every stage of the fuel cycle, from uh, mining and milling the uranium ore and enriching and reprocessing it all the way up to the reactors for electricity, boiling water for the turbines, or making the weapons, is uh, producing uh, these toxic materials in voluminous capacity that last virtually forever. And the business and industry and, and industry and government don't didn't know what and still don't know what to do with it. So uh, I began to uh, think, well, what do we need to know? The public needs to know. It's being done in our name. And the future generations, the tens of thousands of generations that were, are, were saddling with this stuff, that it can cripple and kill and mutate and cause muta uh, it's mutagenic and carcinogenic, and uh, they will want to know and what should we know? So, because this poison fire, as we came to call it, and you remember when you came to join our fire group, uh, we were, realized we had to educate ourselves. And that's a wonderful way to start. 
build on your ignorance and don't trust the experts. And what kinds of radiation? How is it being contained? What are the stories that we tell ourselves? Um, and we uh, realize that something called guardianship, a kind of responsible care for radioactive materials, is of the essence. Of course, it's more convenient to sweep it under the rug, to think that you can dump it in deep geological disposal repositories and put it out of sight and out of mind. But the earth is a, a living system. It's not a safe deposit vault. There are cracks and fissures in the rocks and underwater, underground waters and even from the waste isolation pilot project in New Mexico, the radioactive isotopes, well, it'll leak, it'll leak, and it'll go down into the Picos River, down into the Gulf of Mexico. So, if we care about life, if we feel a link to the future, of course we do. We care for our children. We imagine we care for our children's children's children, then uh, we'll want to keep it out of the biosphere, this stuff. Is it that complicated? Actually not. It's a low-tech operation if you realize that you have to keep repairing the containers. Because no container will last as long as the radioactive contents. What you do need to do is to pay attention to it. Well, that's the last thing that government and industry or most people think you want to do. We want to put it out, this poison fire, this radioactive legacy of ours. The longest legacy, live legacy, that we're going to offer the world. Put it out of mind. But that's the big mistake because then it'll leak. So the one thing we need to do is to be able to put our mind to it. Directing our attention. Remembering. So remembering, that's actually the etymologically the meaning of religion. It's the our assuming a sacred responsibility for life. Don't we want to do that? For what's made in our generation? So, I look at the uh, disasters that have happened, and I'll talk about the guardianship projects in the moment, but it's occurring to me, you know, Chernobyl, and now Fukushima, which bids well to be far worse, but that these are, uh, we can throw up our hands and say it's too late, ah, uh, but they're uh, alarm bells. They're asking us, giving us one more chance and another chance to grow up. And uh, Chernobyl is now 25 years uh, anniversary in another week and a half and uh, that's 25 years that's just the tiniest microsecond of its uh, effect of the uh, plutonium par particles and the other some of the long-lasting radionuclides so that's just a tiny, tiny fraction of the time that we have to remember at the time that Chernobyl is. So one lesson of Chernobyl and now Fukushima is, it's forever. And the other lesson is that it's everywhere. You can't contain it. 
we can tell ourselves, oh, well, now on the West Coast of California, uh, what's coming over from north, northern Japan is hardly measurable. We had a little bit, oh, yes, you might find. It's everywhere. Those winds, those westerlies, they'll circle the globe sooner or later. We know that about Jim. So we're in this together. What a teaching. Really, it's a spiritual teaching. We are not immune to what we do to other people. We can sell them a faulty reactor that even the NRC thinks was unsafe, the Mark I of General Electric, and it can end up contaminating millions in Japan. We're not immune to that. We can't hold, we're one planet. The winds that encircle, just like Yeah. So, what a teaching. Mm -hmm. Fukushima and Chernobyl are forever, and they're everywhere. And so that means we're all in it together. And that we can't afford to be uh, saying, you know, whose side are you on? We all have, we can all work together. We need the expertise of the uh, training of the nuclear engineers. We need to work together to see how we can uh, make this part of our journey. You know, when, when uh, we went uh, to Chernobyl, that was about the time I met you right after that. But one of the big lessons, uh, I was doing workshops in Novosibkov, which is the most contaminated uh, city of its size that's still inhabited. And um, it was a uh, very moving lesson for me. Uh, I learned there that there are two lessons you can draw are two ways of responding to massive collective trauma. One is that you can uh, let it divide you, causing feuding and argument and mutual blame and scapegoating. And that's happened in communities that suffered from Chernobyl, but then the other two. There's always that choice. In a massive collective trauma, you can use that suffering to unite you into solidarity, to breed uh, trust and mutual reliance so that you can work together. So uh, it's hard, <laughs> you know, it's actually hard to build trust in a country that's trying to minimize where our own government's in the pockets of the nuclear industry and our president is in the deep pockets of the huge, what's it, Exelon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for uh, NRC to connive with the industry the way it is. That's suicidal for them as well. We're all in this together. They just don't know it yet. They think that they can blind themselves with the millions they're putting in their pocket. So it's hard not to feel betrayal and anger. It's hard for me. What a lesson to know that we have to work together. But we have to speak the truth as well. We have to face what the poison fire does to living cells, to young bodies, to little bodies in utero. We have to face what, um, what we sort of farmed out to the nuclear mafia and take charge of it ourselves and say, well, let this poison fire uh, be our teacher and it'll teach us to be faithful, it'll teach us to be courageous, 
It'll teach us to speak truth. It'll teach us to remember the future ones. So that's guardianship. So I wanted to tell you about uh, what's happening at Rocky Flats. Um, you know, that's the bomb factory that all during the Cold War was making the plutonium pits, call, they call them triggers, they're like about the size of grapefruits. And each warhead of the entire U.S. arsenal has um, a plutonium pit made in Rocky Flats. Now it's been farmed out to uh, Los Alamos is doing it. I understand, I'm not clear on that. But this Rocky Flats was, thanks to activism, uh, the local activists who showed that with the fires of, uh, there was a fire, several, and, and uh, dissemination, leakage of plutonium. Um, they ceased operation and took down the buildings. And I was out there just uh, last Friday at the fence. Well, the land now has been um, given by Department of Energy to Fish and Wildlife for a um, wildlife reserve and recreational area. <laughs> I'm, I don't know, what do you do, laugh or cry? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, the citizens in, in and around Boulder, Colorado have uh, instituted the Rocky Flats Nuclear Guardianship. And its aim is to uh, see that, is to the extent that is humanly, technically possible, the uh, contamination will be kept out of the biosphere and that we will not allow uh, people to be, and young people particularly, to be contaminated. So we, the Guardian, the Guardianship Project is aiming to um, reverse the decision that is uh, to be a recreational area, that it will uh, the stop a, a freeway or this plan to be built across one area of it, and to build, a, to um, ha have a memorial of some kind, maybe uh, something remembrance, so that people that this can site can be used for not just this generation, but every generation that will follow, um, as a place where uh, we have learned what plutonium can do, and that we will try our best to keep it out of the biosphere. So what is uh, currently on the site right now, the, uh, they, they don't have any more buildings? That's right. But they have <coughs> put the plutonium into uh, and the other highly radioactive waste into um, barrels and into uh, containments and then they've um, covered them over with uh, berms or concrete pads. But through already, through some little trees are growing through the concrete. Mm -hmm. It nothing is. It, it it doesn't take long for the. Uh, if you put it so, that's why guardianship. Maybe we should say this right away. Sees that that ground level monitored, retrievable storage is essential so that we can repair the uh, containments. It's not all that difficult. But again, you have to pay attention. And on the other hand, the um, communities, especially the developers, don't want to know. But plutonium has been found off-site in several uh, homes. And remind us about the half-life of plutonium. Well, see, the half-life is 24,000 years, 24 millennia, and then, then the hazardous life 
is ten times that much. So, and for almost a quarter million years, there will be radioisotopes of plutonium that can kill you. It only takes a milligram to give you a lethal uh, exposure. That's one speck, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I take comfort in the fact that we're teachable and that a great teacher there for us is plutonium itself, the poison fire. I can sort of imagine it saying to us, look, you made me, because it's man-made, you know. It's not a natural sound. You made me. Don't leave me around where I will cripple and kill for all, forever. If you can keep me in mind, I will teach you. If you will learn to guard me, I will become your teacher. I will teach you faithfulness. I will teach you concentration. I will teach you care for life. So that's my <laughs> consolation. I'd rather think in those terms than dismiss us as a pathetically doomed life on this planet. And it's fascinating, too, that the um, Buddhist teachings, ancient Buddhist teachings, didn't they talk about um, poison fire? Yeah, I found that out. It was not... Uh, but the, commu the community that uh, I've been part of in Northwest India, uh, when I was visiting them 20 years ago, 22 years ago, about the time we met, um, they asked me to speak to their monastery, their monastery of about 100 monks, and they asked me to tell them about what is this guardianship, what is this poison fire, this radioactivity you're talking about. And so I did, and uh, they, I said, well, they understand about atoms, don't they? And uh, the High Lama said, well, you better explain. So uh, I asked for a blackboard, and I drew an atom and a nucleus with the protons and neutrons and the nucleus and the electrons and I said this is what Western scientists understand reality to be composed of now and those protons and neutrons at the core in the nucleus that they're held together by the strongest binding power in the universe and in my lifetime and in some of yours Western scientists have found a way to break that apart of a very large and somewhat unstable nucleus of the uranium atom. And when they did that, they can release that strongest power for the first time in the history that we know about, that this has been released. And so what we did with it was we put it in containers and we dropped it on two great cities and we could burn a third of a 360,000 people all at once and many more after because that's how it kills gradually and slowly too all at once and slowly and we used it to boil water and then we discovered that at every stage every stage of that process from digging it out of the ground to turning it into weapons or into electricity, the contamination is produced. Everything, every part of it, every truck, every glove, every tool, and we don't know what to do with it. We want to hide it away. We don't want to look at it. But then, see, I've learned from you, I said to them, I've learned from you that you can remember things. Every day you come together 
to remember the sayings of the Buddha. That's thousands of years ago. And you repeat that. So we can remember too. We'll remember about what we did with the uranium nucleus. We'll remember the toxicity. That's what I think. We can do that. We'll call it guardianship. And it will make us faithful to life. And they said, Oh, I hope you don't ever get tired doing this because this is work of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And then later they told me that they had that they had a tradition that they were the keepers of. It was a wrathful form of Manjushri, the celestial bodhisattva of wisdom. And that this wrathful form was known as the poison molten iron Buddha face. So if you're talking about poison, molten iron, great heat and great toxicity, that's a pretty good way to, if you're trace the teaching back 12 centuries, radioactivity. So they're disciplines of the mind. You'll find them, the Tibetans have that particular form, but I believe you'll find them in in every spiritual tradition. And we have it in every training, a way of training our intention. We can do it. But you have to think if your mind is in a very large, I mean of your life, in a very large context of time. You have to see your life the meaning of your life doesn't begin with your birth and end with your death in this immediate lifetime. But you remember that every atom and every molecule and every cell of your body began with the first splitting and spinning of the stars 14 billion years ago. That you go back that far. So you're part of a really big story. A lot of people are teaching it now. Thomas Berry, Sister Miriam McGillis, Brian Swan, countless people are talking now about the universe story that we're part of. So we have to remember that we have been around the life in us that's um, beating our hearts this minute and breathing our lungs began a long time ago and that it continues on. It's not going to stop when this body dies. And so that you can see this little span that we're living in is a particularly potent chapter or mini chapter in this story. And that we can play something significant right now by keeping our eye on the poison fire and being willing to learn from it. Keeping our eye on the possibilities and the reality of human error. We can do it. We better do it. <laughs> We better do it if life is going on. So we better learn how to act our age. So our fourteen billion years. So, um, if we had, if we were to learn now, if administrators and industry captains and Mr. Obama himself were to learn the, the lesson of uh, Fukushima, what would they do? What would be? the policy imperatives that would be enacted. Well, our brothers and sisters in Germany are already showing us. We take, first of all, we take to the streets, then we get everybody to say, um, we will uh, discontinue 
the generation of electricity and the production of weapons that is threatening all uh, life on earth and life for the next uh, how many thousands of generations so yes we discontinue it and we'd save money we'd save all those loan guarantees that they want to uh, Obama wants to uh, how many 56 36. billion 36. in loan yeah. guarantees uh, Natalia Mironova was showing in her PowerPoint, you probably saw it the other night, that what the nine trillion dollars that the nuclear experiments have cost us. So we have to do what what is needed on almost every other issue, which is accurate cost accounting. And that we can't afford anymore to only think in terms of the uh, short-term profits of the corporations, as powerful as they are. Mm -hmm. So by, by learning the lessons of Chernobyl and, and uh, Fukushima, uh, we'll um, stop calling nuclear energy clean and green. We'll turn to what really is clean and green and discover that if we give some loan guarantees there, we're going to be moving toward a truly sustainable economy that is, uh, will be correcting the greenhouse gas emissions. There's this fable that nuclear power isn't, it is, uh, uh, doesn't involve carbon emissions. That's nuts. Every stage of the fuel cycle is producing that. We can get honest with each other for a change. Yeah, it'll be very good for us. <laughs> oh, I hope this will be true. I'm willing to work for it, as you are. <laughs>